Hello, everyone. Welcome. While we are waiting for everyone to join in a moment, uh, we invite you to open up the chat and tell us where you're joining from. Love to see where everyone's participating from. We have a lot from New York State. We also have uh, friends joining us from the Boston area, Pittsburgh, ah, Connecticut, where I'm from today. Great to see we have a great crowd, expecting uh, close to a thousand people potentially this afternoon. Ah, some names I recognize. Thank you for joining some of my colleagues. We're gonna get going. My name is Ken Elkins. I'm the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon New York, and I'm your host today. Audubon New York is excited to host today's webinar. It's being brought to you by a unique and special partnership of New York State Parks, New York Department of Environmental Conservation, Weed Wrangle, the Garden Club of America New York Clubs, the Native Plant Center, Homegrown National Park, and Audubon New York. A quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording in coming days. We also have the closed captioning feature uh, turned on today. If it is there and you would like it hidden uh, where your um, chat box button is, you also have a CC button and you can either turn that to show or to hide. Now I'd like to pass the microphone to Carol Capabianco, Director of the Native Plant Center at Westchester Community College. Hi, thank you, Ken. Thank you for the information and thank you and Audubon New York for all the work and help and hosting this event. I really, we really appreciate it. And welcome to everyone in Zoom land. Hello, I'm, thank you for joining us today in recognition of New York State's eighth annual Invasive Species Awareness Week. I'm Carol Capobianco, director of the Native Plant Center at Westchester Community College in Valhalla, New York. The Native Plant Center has been promoting the use of native plants since 1998 as the first affiliate of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas. Our main focus is education. We're on a college campus. Uh, we offer classes and workshops such as this and maintain demonstration gardens on the campus. So I hope you'll come and visit when we reopen. Native plants and the wildlife that depend on these plants for food and shelter are threatened by invasive plants that don't belong here. We are here today to talk about what you can do to make your gardens and landscapes more inviting and valuable to birds, butterflies, bees, and other pollinators and animals. As Ken mentioned, this event is brought to you through a special partnership of some stellar nonprofit organizations and government agencies. And we've joined together because we recognize the critical need to tackle invasive species, many of which are still being sold in nurseries, unfortunately. And we know that you as gardeners can help. For one, avoid purchasing invasive species. The subject is vast. So we've decided for today to immerse you in learning about details of some common offenders and their native alternatives. We want you to come away not overwhelmed, but with a deeper knowledge about specific plants. Our speakers will cover identification of these particular invasive species, which native plants work well as replacements for these invasives, the benefit of these natives to birds and pollinators, and then after you've removed the invasives from your yard and planted natives and invited birds, we want to tell you how to get your garden on the map as a homegrown national park. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Molly Hassett, a forester for the Bureau of Forest Resource Management for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. She will talk about invasive species. Thank you, Molly. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Carol. Um, if we could go to the next slide, let's dive right into it. So invasive species were not historically in New York, but they were brought here often by people. Um, invasive species can harm the environment, economy, or human health. 
And I've got three different examples on this slide of some of the invasive plant species we have in New York. So on the left hand picture, it's a picture of kudzu, an invasive vine. And kudzu harms the environment, as you can see from this picture, by growing over all the plants as well as tree species in that area. Uh, next slide, please. So water chestnut is the middle picture there. Water chestnut grows inside lakes and ponds, and it can grow really extensive populations. Water chestnut can harm the economy and recreation just by growing in such dense mats. So you can see that there's some canoers pulling out water chestnut in that picture. But what you might not see is all the canoers that might have been there before them, or even them themselves getting stuck in those mats of water chestnut. I've done it myself and it's really hard to get out. So it can be pretty discouraging if you're trying to canoe inside a lake or a water body that has water chestnut. And wild parsnip is another plant, which is pictured to the right on the slide. Water or wild parsnip can harm human health. You see it growing along the roadways in New York State and I'm sure other states, it's pretty widespread inside the summer. Um, if you cut wild, wild parsnip or even walk in it, brush it against your skin, and then expose your skin to the sunlight, the sap on wild parsnip can give you a pretty severe burn. So all sorts of impacts from invasive species we have here in New York. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to move into the different invasive species we're going to talk about today and how to identify them a little bit better. So the first one that we're gonna talk about today is Norway maple. Uh, Norway maple is a tree that can grow up to 40 or 60 feet tall. It's originally from Europe and Western Asia, and it's a really popular straight tree here. And people grow it on their front lawns. It provides like a really dense shade, but when it can escape into forests and other natural areas, that really dense shade stops other native plants and trees from growing inside that area. So it kind of takes over the forest. So Nora maple kind of looks like sugar maple, one of our native species. It's got uh, the five lobes there, if you can see the picture on the bottom of the screen. However, if you pull the leaf off the tree, Norway maple has a milky white sap. So if you give it a couple seconds, some sap will start to come out of the stem. Next slide. So the next species we're gonna talk about is calorie pear. Um, so calorie pear, pear is a really popular ornamental tree planted along streets and in people's lawns, again. Um, calorie pear is native to Asia and it really likes to take over naturally open areas like grasslands. It can grow up to 30 to 50 feet tall, so not as big of a tree here. And you can identify it generally well from having really vertical branches. So if you look at the picture in the top right there, a lot of the branches you can see aren't going horizontally across, but they're growing like almost straight up. Another way to look for calorie pear or try to identify it is look for shiny toothed leathery leaves. The leaves are like pretty thick and very, very shiny. And those leaves can turn purple or reddish in the fall. In the springtime, uh, you can identify calorie pear as well by the tree has, the flowers on the tree have a very distinct unpleasant smell. I've got like a whole bunch inside my neighborhood here. And as we walk past them, it kind of smells like wet fish food. It's, it's not a great smell. Um, and as you get closer to the fall, uh, they produce uh, small hard brown fruits, which you can see kind of in the middle of the screen there. And they're all grouped together and clumped. Calorie pear, because of its really vertical branch structure, has really weak branches. So the bottom right picture is a calorie pear where the branch got hit by like a windstorm, I think, and just snapped right off, which can be another identifying feature. If you see trees in your neighborhood that have lost branches like that, it could have been a calorie pear to take a closer look at. Um, next slide, please. So the next one we'll talk about is burning bush. Burning bush is native to Northeastern Asia and it's popular as an ornamental shrub. It forms 
like thicket to natural areas. It grows really extensively and really thickly, which stops other trees and other native plants from being able to push up and get to the sunlight, which you can kind of see inside the planting in the top right of all the red burning bush plants. And um, burning bush, one of the ways you I can, can identify it, of course, is by those really, really red leaves in the fall. Although some of our native plants have leaves that are also that red, which we'll talk about later. Um, but really unique to burning bush, I'd say the most unique to it is that it has these wing stems. So if you look past all of the leaves, um, the stems have kind of woody structures around the main part of the stem, which are like, I don't know, it's hard to describe, very flat, almost like wings on each side. It's a really neat feature to look at if you ever find a burning bush. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so the next plant is multiflora rose bush. It's native to eastern China, Japan, and Korea. It's also popular as an ornamental shrub, which is why we're talking about it today. And I think back in the 1930s, it was pretty widely planted as a natural fence, especially along highways. Um, and you can see in the top picture, there's a multiflora rose bush, or maybe a group of multiflora rose bush that's actually taking up the majority of that picture. So you can see how tall it grows and how extensive it is as a shrub or as a natural fence. Um, it also has spines, so it can deter people and animals from going through it to some extent too. So even more fencing. Um, it grows up to 15 feet tall and about 13 feet wide. And it does look similar to our other native rose species. Uh, it has curved spines, which you can see in the bottom picture, as well as these neat fringe stipules at the base of the leaf. So if you lift, if you take off like a whole grouplet of the leaves, there's kind of hairs, which I have circled in the slide, um, that distinguish it from some of our native species. Also, multiflora rose is a white flower where a lot of our native species are pink or pinkish flowers. Uh, next slide. Chinese silvergrass is another, again, ornamental shrub that's planted fairly widely by people. It's native to China, Japan, and Korea. And it also takes over naturally open areas like grasslands, and it can increase fire hazard. Um, the species, I believe is one of the spe uh, grass species that actually kind of likes to burn. So it, it can increase fire hazard if you ever have a fire in your area, it's not that likely. But um, it grows up to 10 feet tall and it's got pretty flexible branches that can spread or droop. But I'd say the main distinguishing factor is that the leaves have a silvery white midrib so if you look at the picture kind of in the middle of the screen to the left of the other two pictures, each stem right in the middle there, there's a silver or kind of a white mid rain that's pretty distinctive and runs all the way along it. And the flower heads have more than three branches on them, which might be able to help distinguish it as well. Next species. And the last species I'll talk about here is English ivy vine, which is native to Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa. It's planted as an ornamental as well. I think I might actually have some in my yard that I need to pull out. Um, English ivy vine grows in these really dense mats over native plants and can kill them out by limiting their light. If you look in the top picture, all of the really dark green plants there underneath it looks like maybe some sort of spruce tree, are English ivy vines. And they just form a mat over where it might have otherwise been lawn, or maybe it started out as a garden. They have evergreen leaves, and the leaves are dark green, shiny, and leathery. And if you look really closely at those leaves, they've got these light yellow veins. So those are the species we're going to be focusing on today. Um, I also want to do a quick talk about, oh, <laughs> thank you. Some of the ways you can find out more about invasive species in your area. So in New York, we're lucky enough to have 
eight partnerships for regional invasive species management. So we've got the Adirondacks, St. Lawrence, Eastern Lake Ontario, Capital Region, Catskill, Lower Hudson, Long Island, Finger Lakes, and started to go into a woodland near your house and you want to figure out Sorry, folks, we're having a uh, connection issue with Molly. Uh, she was explaining the unique uh, arrangement of the PRISM groups. We also have uh, quite a few resources that uh, one of our panelists will be sharing in a few moments these resources on our uh, chat box. They'll be sending the links that you can be able to uh, see DEC's plant-wise brochure. Uh, some people have been asking about access to these slides. This brochure has all that information from Molly and other invasives that we weren't able to cover in our short amount of time today. There's also some ways you can identify plants, including the invasive species at home. One of those that you might not be aware of is the Seek app. It takes the camera from your phone and almost immediately recognizes not just plants, but just about every item in nature. Uh, is something that you can do. And if it can't figure it out, it has a function for asking an expert. If many of you are interested in invasives and see an area that you're concerned about uh, the uh, invasives in your area and want to report them, uh, we can use a new app called IMAP Invasives. And in New York State is organized by the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse. Uh, but we're putting a link in the chat box in just a moment that you can download that app for uh, any area and not just for New York State. Sorry, we lost uh, Molly there, but I'm going to pass it back to Carol to introduce our next speaker. Hi, yes, thanks. Sorry, Molly, we, we missed your ending. Um, but everyone, as you can see, you know, invasive species can be beautiful on the outside, but really don't be fooled by them. Tear them out. You know. um, we learned why you need to remove invasives. So now let's find out what native plants to replace them with, these particular invasives especially. Carolyn Summers is author of Designing Gardens with Flora of the American East. She's a member of the Native Plant Center Steering Committee and owner of the 300-acre Flying Trillium Preserve in the Catskills, which, which lucky for you is having a free open garden tour this weekend, tours I should say plural, June 12th and 13th. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn Summers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Carol. Thank you for the um, PR, <laughs> public relations, and thank you Molly for setting me up for this. Um, so I've got, um, I've got a limited time, so I'm going to jump right into the substitutes that you can use instead of those plants that Molly was explaining um, are just invasive and bad actors. So here we have um, white oak um, flowers and trees, I want to emphasize, are really the most important. They will, trees and shrubs will provide the structure for your garden landscape. And trees are like giant filters cleansing the air and water. Next slide, please. Here's a close up of the, um, the white um, oak flowers and the cute little tiny little pink leaves that are just coming out. And you'll hear more um, about oaks um, later in this session um, and about how important they are for habitat. But I'm gonna concentrate on structure. Um, this is a, next slide, please. This is a beautiful, um, our beautiful champion, white oak, um, New York State champion. Um, I hope it's still standing. It, uh, this photograph is from about 10 years ago and it was taken in Yonkers, New York. And um, you can see what a magnificent specimen that is. Um, white oaks get beautiful um, burgundy and sort of reddish tinted leaves in the fall. 
Next slide, please. Red oak is um, also um, one of our beautiful oaks, and it's probably the easiest one to find in your in your um, your neighborhood nursery. Um, pretty much any nursery will be selling red oak. It is also one of it is probably the easiest to transplant, and it is relatively fast growing. But in fact, there is an oak tree for every garden. Um, in fact, um, for some very specialized situations. Next slide, please. So here we have um, scarlet oak and we have um, Quercus palustris pin oak. And these two oak trees are sort of the opposite spectrum in terms of siting. So scarlet oak will, will um, do well on a nice well-drained site, whereas uh, pin oaks will actually survive periods of standing water, making them excellent for use in rain gardens and um, other types of, of uh, wet meadow type situations. Next slide, please. Here's, a, here's an example of pin oak. Um, and they have a very distinctive shape with skirts at the bottom where their leaves sort of, their branches sort of go down. And then in the middle, they have horizontal branches and they're topped with a beautiful, nice spire. Both scarlet and um, pin oaks have lacy leaves compared with the red and the black oaks. Next slide, please. Here is a photograph of scarlet oak um, holding its color well into November. Oaks do hold their leaves quite a long time, which can be very nice in the fall. Um, and um, next slide. This is what the um, same tree, this is obviously summertime. So this tree was planted about 20 years ago on a well-drained hillside. And you can see it's gotten to be quite a large specimen in just that small amount of time. Next slide, please. Moving into plants that you would um, use to substitute for the flowering dogwood, the, the oaks that I mentioned were um, substitutes for obviously for the Norway maple. Um, but um, now we're going to substitute for the calorie pears. And so flowering dogwood certainly comes to mind as one of our most beautiful and useful uh, flowering trees. Um, and he, next slide, please. We have um, variations in the color. You can get them with beautiful pink edges to the bracts or almost totally pink bracts. Some of them can be almost quite uh, red. And next slide, please. Um, the dogwood berries themselves, um, which we'll hear more about, are actually quite beautiful in the, in the late, late summer um, when they start to really ripen up and they can make um, the tree kind of glow a little bit red. Next slide. Fall foliage is something that dogwoods really don't get a lot of um, recognition for, but in fact, they have beautiful fall foliage, um, almost translucent in, in shade and some, some reds, some oranges, and sometimes um, even all the way into purple. Next slide, please. Here is a, a shot of um, dogwood and right next to it on the left is the viburnum prunifolium. And the viburnum prunifolium is one of our very underutilized small trees. It's our only viburnum that becomes a small tree and it can actually grow as tall as 20 feet, um, making it an ideal tree for small, um, smaller lawns um, that really can't quite accommodate a full-size dogwood. Um, and you know, it is, uh, here, here's, next slide, here's a shot of their beautiful, a close-up shot of their beautiful uh, flowers. And they also have birds, uh, berries for the birds. Next slide, please. So in this slide, um, this shows a relatively new planting to illustrate the many benefits from planting a small grove of trees with ground cover for wildlife instead of the single specimen um, that we're used to surrounded by wood chips and lawn. And this is something to consider when you're doing any kind of tree planting is possibly making a group of trees as opposed to the single one. Next slide, please. So high bush blueberry is one of the best substitutes for burning bush and burning bush is just an awful <laughs> an awful, awful thing. Um, if you've ever been in a natural area that's been overcome by it, you can see what a terrible problem and how destructive it is. But look at the color on this blueberry um, and the nice rounded shape. 
blueberries rarely need pruning to look well tended, unlike the, the um, burning bush, which will become huge and gangly if it's not kept up. Next slide, please. Um, this is what a blueberry looks like in flower. Next slide, please. And here are bumblebees. Bumblebees are the best blueberry pollinators, even better than um, honeybees um, as pollinators for our blueberries. Next slide, please. This is a, a photograph of the very beautiful um, blueberries themselves, which of course are ephemeral because we're probably going to eat them as soon as we're done taking this picture. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna run through a few slides now of wild blueberries. Um, these blueberries are unretouched. They are unmanaged. They have not been shaped or um, they are not cultivars. And this is how beautiful they look um, in the wild. This high bush blueberry, next slide. This one has actually been pruned a little bit at the bottom by the deer. Next slide, please. That's a beautiful scarlet one. Next, please. And as you can see in this late fall view, these wild blueberries have good color and are all well shaped. And these are all field grown wild blueberries. Next, please. So this is the New York Botanical Gardens native plant garden. And if any of you have, have not been able to get over there, if, if some of you who live locally would like to get there, it's, it's, a, it's well worth the trip. And this is their blueberry hedge. So as you can see, a lot of people use um, burning bush as a hedge, but blueberries will do just as well. And this is just starting to grow in. It's, all, it's obviously kind of new. Um, next slide. And this is what it looks like in the spring. And look at all of those beautiful little flowers. Those are all blueberry flowers. They will all become little blueberries. And I just don't know how the New York Botanical Garden is going to keep from having everybody gobbling them up. Well, maybe the staff will get them first. Next. So now we're going to talk about substitutes for multiflora rose. Um, this right here is Rosa caroliniana, and this is a very useful um, shrub. It um, will actually um, make more of itself um, with some, um, some roots. So if you don't like that, you need to cut it back, but it will um, it will require occasional cutbacks, but it doesn't get very tall, unlike Rosa virginiana. Um, our next slide, next. Rosa virginiana um, has beautiful, wonderful, these, these all have wonderful scented flowers, by the way, and obviously great for pollinators. But um, virginiana and caroliniana will require a little bit of management because they do tend to um, spread. So that's just something to be aware of. Next slide, please. Rosa palustris is our swamp rose. And as you can see, it has this beautiful vase shape um, and it's covered with flowers and it's a wonderful plant to use in a rain garden or this one is growing right next to a pond and actually in standing water most of the season. So, um, but I think it can also probably grow in pretty moderate soil, um, mesic soil. Next, please. So our native climbing rose, Rosa tetagera, this is my favorite of the native uh, roses. Um, and um, as you can see, it's very floriferous. It's growing on a fence um, outside my vegetable garden. And next, please. Uh, next to um, our rubus, our native black raspberries. Um, so what could be better? Roses and rubus. Speaking of rubus, next slide, please. We have here Rubus odoratus, which is a lot of people think um, is a rose. If they, if they don't know better, they may see it and say, oh, because it looks very rose-like. It has sort of maple leaf leaves and um, it has a really very, very long blooming season. Here is a close-up, next slide. Here's a close-up of what it looks like. And you can see the, the, the uh, flowers are really very rose-like. It's very adaptable. It will grow anywhere. It will grow in sun. It will grow in shade. It will grow in moist. It will grow in dry. It's one of the most dependable shrubs you can grow. And yes, it does have berries. Um, the jury is kind of out on how delicious they are. Some people love them. Some people think they're kind of insipid, but they are definitely edible. Next. 
Now we're going to talk about substitutes for miscanthus. So um, one of the best uh, native grasses um, and one of the tallest um, is Sorgastrum newtons, Indian grass. And that has a, a really beautiful inflorescence at the top. As you can see here, these are all backlit and very, um, very lovely. Next slide. Panicum virgatum um, north wind is another very upright um, and, and an excellent um, uh, sort of, you could sort of be fooled by this into thinking that it was miscanthus, but this is our native Panicum virgatum. And here it's being used as an actual hedge. Next slide, please. So um, here's another uh, view of Panicum. Um, I think it's the same cultivar. And it looks sort of like a beautiful gray fog back there. It's an excellent um, upstanding um, background plant for, for an, another um, beautiful planting in front of it. Next slide, please. So this is a seeded mix of panicum and Indian grass mixed together. Um, and you can do this on a large scale or you can do it here as a small scale, just a sort of a little um, bunch of it in the middle of a grassy area. Next slide, please. Um, I wouldn't, um, I would be remiss if I talked about grasses and didn't talk about our little blue stem grass because it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, it's probably the most adaptable because it doesn't get quite as tall as some of the other ones. It also comes in a range of color effects um, if you uh, don't mind using cultivars. Next slide, please. This shows little blue stem in two different arrangements. In the front here in the, in the foreground, we have it interspersed with asters and other fall blooming plants. And in the background, further back, you see um, a, a full a stand of just, um, just little blue stem all by itself. That's sort of, um, sort of off red, sort of brownish red um, bank back there. That's all little blue stem. Next. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, substitutes for the invasive English ivy, um, which is often used as a ground cover, um, which is kind of sad because there are so many good ground covers, so many wonderful native ground covers. If you're in a sunny situation and a lot of people do plant um, English ivy to cover banks that they don't want to have to mow, Phlox subulata is a wonderful substitute. It comes in a range of colors. <coughs> <clears throat> from white to pink to almost purpley. And you can see it here mixed with some sedges. And it's one of the easiest plants to find in every nursery center carries this in the spring. It's a very popular plant, possibly our most popular native plant um, in terms of nursery availability. Next slide, please. So Appalachian sedge is shown here, and that's the that's what was mixed in there with the uh, moss phlox. But there are so many sedges that you can use. There's Pennsylvania sedge, rose sedge. Um, anyway, these sedges are also wonderful ground covers. They don't get very tall at all. You don't have to mow them, but some of them you can mow them if, if you need to. Um, and they make excellent ground covers either alone or with the flowers as I sh has shown in the previous slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Carol. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carolyn. Wow, I was like a kid in a candy store looking at those pictures. I'm sure some of them are from your preserve. So get on up there. And dogwood happens to be my favorite tree. Uh, and one other, you know, I think people should remember too that um, you can also eat some of these fruit, uh, not the dogwood, but you know, the blueberries certainly as Carolyn mentioned. And today I was, at lunchtime, I went out to my amelanchier, my service berry or June berry, and I was picking off and eating all those delicious berries. So um, the native plants are the way to go. So, so now that you've now uh, you've replaced your invasives with native plants, how is it going to make a difference in your life and in wildlife? Our next speaker will talk about how birds in particular benefit from native plants. In fact, it's an interest in my interest in birds that got me involved and started in native plants, uh, in loving native plants, getting, getting to know and love native plants, I should say. Karen Thomas is chair of Audubon New York, the state office of the National Audubon Society, and she will share some really interesting facts and bird photos on native plants. So please join me in welcoming Karen Thomas. Great. 
Thank you, Carol, and Carolyn, for those beautiful photos and descriptions of our native plant substitutes. And I'm just the opposite of um, Carol, that uh, native plants brought me to birds and therefore to Audubon. So before I talk about the benefit of these native plants that Carol had described, a word of uh, appreciation for our birds. Uh, they bring us joy and beauty, and they are seed dispersers and pollinators and they're indicators of a healthy ecosystem. And they have sustained us during this very difficult year with their song and feeder displays and migration magic. Here is our gorgeous state bird, New York state bird, Eastern bluebird perched on native redbud. Next. But our birds are in trouble. Three billion birds have been lost in the last 50 years and one in eight bird species are threatened with global extinction. And Audubon's modeling predicts that climate change puts two thirds of North American species at risk. Our backyard birds who visit our feeders, nuthatch, American goldfinch, dark-eyed junco, and one of my favorites, next, the white-throated sparrow are all threatened. Imagine an early spring without his sweet song. Next, and 41% of all neotropical migratory songbirds are in decline. Habitat loss due to the built environment is by far the greatest factor in this decline. Two and a half times more influential than any other. But, that's why we're all here today. We can help. By pulling invasives and planting natives, we build back biodiversity and restore the habitat to provide birds with the food, shelter, nesting sites they need throughout the year. As gardeners, we use plant phenology when selecting plants to create a place of beauty and interest, noting the time of flowering to provide sequestered bloom and color, time of leafing to provide structure and texture, time of fruiting for harvest, time of seeding for propagation. Next. I'm just going to take a sip of water. We can overlap those life cycles of our plants with the life cycles of our birds. Nesting, migrating, wintering to attract and provide for a greater diversity of birds in all seasons creating a space not only beautiful to look at, but one that is ecologically alive, making resources available when birds need it the most. In spring, birds need protein, preferably from insects, to rebuild muscle lost during migration and to feed their chicks. In summer, the overworked adults need sugar-filled fruits to fuel their hunts for their young. And in the fall, many of our shrubs produce berries that ripen and have a high fat content for fall migrants. And in the winter, there are fruits and seeds that are persistent and provide the high caloric value birds need to survive cold conditions. Birds need all the food native plants provide, berries and fruits, seeds and nuts, and nectar. But insects are essential. A world without insects is a world without birds. Next. Our native oaks are blooming in early May. Carolyn pointed this out. Notice those long string-like flowering bodies. Lots of small flying insects are attracted to the pollen in those flowers. And birds depleted from migration are looking for those protein-rich insects. Birders have learned that they'll find warblers and other migrating songbirds in oak trees. Next. 96% of land birds rely on insects to feed their young. Okay. And baby birds eat a lot. In the 16 days before they fledge, a clutch of chickadees will eat over 9,000 caterpillars. And where are the parents to find all those caterpillars? Not at a non-native ginkgo. And thanks to Doug Tallamy, we know that the best source for those caterpillars are our native oaks, over 500 species. 
The invasive Norway maple is, a is not a preferred food of our native insects. The sticky sap and in the leaves and seeds make it unpalatable for our mammals and birds like gross beaks. Nor and uh, Bali discussed this, but it is an important fact. Nori maple does leaf out early and its dense canopy prevents wildflowers and other natives from taking root. And that affects resource availability and diversity for our birds. Oaks are a critical keystone species in our Eastern forests and they're ecologically valuable in all seasons. Their autumn acorns are consumed by jays, nuthatches and crossbills who depend on the protein rich energy of nuts. And blue jays go nuts, literally stashing enough acorns to last until next spring. This forest bird is a force of nature, cashing up to three to 5,000 acorns in one fall season. And leave the fallen leaves. Caterpillars overwinter in leaf litter and leaves and twigs build up in the soil and attract many insects that are good for food, good food for birds. A diversity of plants will bring a diversity of insects that will support a stable and diverse bird population. Research has found that only the yards with a plant composition made up of more than 70% of native plants were able to produce the food to support enough chickadees to sustain a stable population. And more than 90% of herbivorous insects will eat only one or a few native plants. So the use of a diversity of native plants and landscaping is essential to ensure breeding birds have enough insect prey to eat. And here is our beautiful flowering dogwood, another valuable native tree with blooms in spring, excuse me, blooms in May, providing nectar and pollen for our insects. And in the fall, this nutritious dogwood berry with high fat content for migration is just the right size for wood thrush. A recent study found that migratory songbirds consume fruits from native plants at a faster rate than fruits from non-natives. Non and the fruits of native plants are of greater nutritional value to the migrating birds than the fruits of invasive plants. And like Carol, I just saw a bunch of cedar wax wings going bananas over my emelanchiar eating those berries. Flux subulata is our sun-loving substitute for English ivy, and it provides essential early nectar for our pollinators, butterflies, and hummingbirds. As this ruby-throated hummingbird builds her nest and raises her young, she needs nectar from spring and summer flowers. She must consume one and a half times the body weight in nectar each day, visiting blooms 18 times an hour. An overlapping season of bloom with this columbine in spring, bee balm and cardinal flower in the summer, and late season salvias will help her to double her weight for fall migration, a 500 mile nonstop crossing of the Gulf of Mexico. Wild ginger, a shade loving alternative to English ivy, provides an early source of pollen and nectar for insects and is an excellent ground cover for birds and wild, other wildlife. It is really one of my favorite plants. And it has a bonus factor. Wild ginger naturalizes easily in shade and who doesn't love native plants for free or to share? High blood, high High bush blueberry is our number one recommended native shrub to plant. It has white bell-shaped flowers in the spring, delicious fruits in the summer, and beautiful red and purple fall foliage, and it hosts over 200 species of caterpillars. Thanks. Our bluebird has found the perfect summer four o'clock snack, sugar-filled fruits to fuel their foraging for insects for their chicks. In the spring, our native roses provide food for many pollinators, those bumblebees that Carolyn showed. And in the fall and into winter, 20 bird species are drawn to the persistent fruits. These red belly woodpeckers, excuse me, this red belly woodpecker has scored a beak fill with two rose hips made more palatable after frost. And the rose's dense thicket growth pro provides protection from predators 
and safe places for nest sites. Our native hollies, junipers, and cedars give shelter, give shelter to our overwintering birds. Next. In the in, excuse me. Our native grasses serve birds in all seasons. Little blue stem, panicums attract insects and provide cover and nesting sites and have seeds from October through March and leave those spent flower heads on thistles, echinacea and goldenrods, leaving the seeds. And you will invite these, these plants in your yard and you'll have birds all winter long. Audubon's native plants database has been designed, designed to help people find the native plants to replace invasives and to support wildlife. Simply enter your zip code here, as well as your email, and the database will show you a customized list of plants native to your area. The database is filterable by type of plant, tree, shrub, perennial, grass, and by the type of bird you want to attract, and by the food source that will attract birds, just what we've been talking about, nectar, fruit, insect, nuts, nuts or seeds, and local nurseries and retailers and websites where you can find the plants on your list. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for zooming in and to my wonderful partners on this webinar. And now I would like to hand it over to Casey McAllister, our own force of nature. Casey? Thank you, Karen, and a special thank you to Audubon New York for hosting this webinar today. My name is Casey McAllister, and I'm a member of the Garden Club of Nashville, which is a member of the Garden Club of America. I'm also the coordinator for Weed Wrangle. Weed Wrangle started as a one-time event in Nashville, Tennessee in 2015. But we had 500 people show up to volunteer, so what do you do with that? Well, guess you just keep going. As my presentation today, I want to show you this really fun video that we created to explain what Weed Wrangle is and how you can partner with us as we spread awareness across the country. Weed Wrangle started as a P4P, a small little project as you will see. One city, 20 parks, 500 volunteers, what a lark. A one-time event is what we thought. The next thing you know, we've partnered with state parks. Off we go, out of our box, creating a structure with nationwide friends. Who knows where and when or if this will end? Suddenly, we're partnering all over the land, in 18 states, national parks, and with Doug Tallamy too. We have lots of fans and hopefully soon you. Invasive plants affect all land the same. They ruin healthy ecosystems and they mess with my brain. Weeds have ruined our eyeballs forever. A wrangle can refresh your vision anew. Weed wrangle you say? How can I help? What can I do? Why start a weed wrangle in your own hometown? We will help you make sure it all goes down. It's yours to use any way you want. Partner, collaborate, and have fun too. You can do this. Yes, I said you. Partnerships connect volunteers with public land. You can educate and eradicate. Just make a plan. Restore native communities and create new habitats. Increase biodiversity just like that on public lands and in your garden too. See what a little education can do, because together we can make a difference. Now wrangle on, partner. So in 2020, we partnered with New York State Parks to host several Weed Wrangle events in the spring. And then, as we all know, the world stopped turning and the invasive plants just kept on growing. In response, last year, we partnered with all these same wonderful organizations to host this webinar. We also launched a nationwide stay at home weed wrangle. This summer, we will be hosting events 
We'd wrangle events in the New York State Parks on Long Island. We've already had two events this week. One at Comset State Park and the other at Connecticut River State Park Preserve. So be on the lookout so you can come and volunteer with us. This year, we've partnered with Doug Tallamy's Homegrown National Park as part of our stay at home weed wrangle. We wanna encourage you all to get that one awful invasive out of your yard and make a plan and get on the map with Doug Tallamy's Homegrown National Park. Today, I wanna introduce you to Michelle Alfandari. She calls herself the beginner and she's gonna tell you why. Michelle also is gonna tell us about this new initiative called Homegrown National Park and its roots. Take it away, Michelle. Okay. All right, thank you, Casey, and thank you, Audubon, for uh, hosting. Am I getting um, the video? There we go, okay. Thank you, Audubon, for hosting and all the panelists for inviting me in. Um, I really appreciate it. My presentation is about the nonprofit Homegrown National Park, co-founded by Doug Tallamy and me. I'm sure most of you know Doug and none of you know me, and that is understandable. I have not been involved in your world and actually never thought I would be, but I am now and I happy, I'm happy to be, but it's in a way that's part of the story of Homegrown National Park part of what I bring to the partnership with Doug and a large part of Homegrown's target audience. And now a bit of the story. Next slide and next slide. So once upon a time, I lived in New York City. In fact, I lived there for a long time, close to 40 years. And while I was there, I loved living there. My husband loved living there. I also traveled a lot. I ran a licensing agency that built and marketing agency that built businesses from intellectual property for big corporations and nonprofits. Now you can file that away uh, because it will come into play later. One day, quite surprising to both my husband and myself, we felt we needed a little bit more connection to nature. And so astoundingly, next slide, we moved. We sold our apartment and we moved and found ourselves on a dirt road in rural Northwest Connecticut. The house that we got came with, we learned, a professional but rather neglected garden. And thankfully, it also came with an astounding, wonderful couple that lived next door, both of them professional horticulturalists, landscape designers, soil scientists, and also passionate about restoring biodiversity by planting native. They introduced themselves and they offered help with our garden, to which I responded. Yes, I know nothing about gardening. They took that with the grain of salt that one might until they realized I was telling the truth. Uh, next slide. After some self, I think out of self-preservation, they suggested that I read this book by this author, Doug Tallamy. Uh, you may recall that this was a New York Times bestseller, so it had broad appeal, very easily, easy to read and understand for the lay person. But before I could really dive into the book, they also suggested that I go to a lecture by Dave that was, Doug that was happening in the uh, local school. Next slide, please. And what I learned at this talk was horrifying to me. I knew about, sort of knew about loss of habitat, uh, knew that where there was overdevelopment. What I didn't know was anything else. I didn't understand what degraded biodiversity meant. I didn't understand what ecosystem services were, let alone losing them. And nor did I understand how important that was to our survival, to the human's survival. So sort of got a little depressed, a little down, a little bad human movement, but Doug doesn't let you linger there too long before he tells you, well, that's the bad news. Next slide, please. And here's the good news. There's a simple science-based solution, plant native, remove invasives, and it's something that we can do one person at a time. We don't have to wait. Well, that was a eureka moment and everybody in the audience was just energized. Hands were going up, questions were being asked, what invasive to pull, what, to, what plant to replace, all the things that we were hearing from the panel today. 
I also was very excited, but for a different reason. Next slide, please. If you recall, I'm developed new businesses. If you develop new businesses, you need to know what the, what, where the opportunities are and that's called white space. And I'm sitting there in my seat in this audience and I'm thinking, there is so much opportunity here. There is so much unarticulated need. People, there are so many like me, millions and millions of people who do not know anything about this and just like me, if they did, would take action. I wanted to meet Doug. I wanted to tell him that I could help him scale his message. So we did, we met. Next slide, please. We met, he spoke one language, I spoke another, we met, we talked. We came to common ground on many issues. Number one, we both believed very, very strongly that we had to reach beyond the choir, reach people like me, not like me and my age or where I live, but all the people out there who don't know that this problem exists and that there is the simplest solution. We also agreed that we didn't wanna duplicate services from so many organizations that exist, like the ones that are on this panel. We also agreed that we really didn't wanna start an organization, but we did. So we failed on the last, but we succeeded on the first two. Next slide, please. We formed Homegrown National Park based on the book, Nature's Best Hope. There are, I'm not going to go through each of the points, but primarily what excited me was the fact that there was a big problem. There was a problem that there was a simple solution for it, that we could do this one person at a time, that we could start with homeowners who do not need permission to plant native, to uh, remove their invasives, and they can begin the process of creating new ecological networks and connecting new corridors for wildlife. What Doug made a point of in the book was that it had to be voluntary and not mandated. And so this created a, the kind of challenge I really like. How do we creatively get people to take an action and to understand this problem? Next slide, please. So we formed Homegrown National Park as a call to action. Next slide. That call to action is based on a strategy of pull, push, and engage, which means get on the map. The map is a very, very critical part of our call to action. Next slide. What I'm talking about in pull is that Homegrown National Park's entire reason for being is to reach beyond the people that are already aware of, this, of the issue of degraded biodiversity and, and loss of ecosystem services, whether they are six years old or 100 years old, whether they live in the city, in the suburbs, or in the countryside, whether they garden or don't, whether they're conservationists or not. Our job is to inspire them, to motivate them, and to show them that they are empowered to make a discernible difference and leave a legacy for, for time to come. Once we get somebody's interest, though, we have to make it very, very easy for them to get started, and that's the push. We push out to all the organizations, the businesses, the nurseries, the landscape designers, the conservation organizations, the organizations like Lee Langle and Audubon and the parks departments to communities and individuals so that it is easy for them to get started. Uh, we are building a robust uh, resource uh, uh, list on our site that will be easily accessible to anybody. Once somebody plants native, we want them to get on the map. Why? Next slide, please because the, net, the map is a symbol of an individual action in a greater whole. That greater whole meaning that what you are doing is creating an opportunity to create new ecological corridors. So once you sign on, or if you just want to see what's happening in your neighborhood, you click on the drop down to the state that you want to see. In this case, it would be New York. Once you get to the state, the counties in that state will light up where everybody has, where anyone has planted native and been on and signed on the map. It lights up like a firefly, our icon. Once you hit the county, then the fireflies light up for every zip code where somebody has planted native. And it shows the acreage and the number of people that are on the map. Our goal is 20 million acres. We are at about 20,000 
we have well over 8,000 people on the map representing all 50 states. So we have a long way to go, but we've made a great start. Next slide, please. We just got started. We uh, started our website, was launched in October of 2020. The map went live in January of this year. We have Doug's actual own website is embedded in the Hunger National Park website. We have a newsletter. We're on just about most social media platforms. And very recently we received, delighted, uh, official IRS 501c3 nonprofit designation. So we are just getting started, but we've made great strides. In order to take it to the next level, we need to work together. Next slide, please. And here's how. We ask all of you to please get on the map, be the influencers, be the leaders in this movement. Encourage your neighbors, encourage your membership, your employees, your clients, your customers to get on the map. Spread the word, family, friends. Follow us on social media. List your organization or business on our resource directory. Put the link to the Homegrown National Park map on your site. Check out our yard sign and handout available templates on our site and stay in touch. We love collaborating. Next slide, please. This is an example of one of the things that we did on Instagram to try to get people jazzed about restoring biodiversity and planting native. Okay, thank you very much. That's a quick tour of Homegrown National Park. We believe if you get on the map, you'll light yourself up like a firefly does, and it will also light others up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. That was great. You know, I always call Doug Tallamy a rock star in the native plant world. So that song really ended with a great, you know, <laughs> rocking and rolling. And thanks for your great story as well. So. Thank you. We are going to begin, uh, we know we are running out of time, but I hope some of you will stay uh, to have a, a short Q&A question and answer segment. Panelists, if you all will turn on your videos. And audience members, thank you for all the questions you have been sending, but if you still wanna send more we'll, we'll, through the chat, we'll take those. And before, well, as you're doing that, I have a few announcements to make. Again, the webinar is being recorded and it will reside on Audubon New York's YouTube channel site. A link will be sent to you by email or sent to everyone who registered when this, the video is up and running. So be aware of that. Many of you asked about that. You also asked about links that have been put into the chat and we will try to put that into the email as well. So you have everything in one place. Um, we also would like your comments and ideas. We are sending out a link in the chat for a survey to fill out about New York State Invasive Species Awareness Week. And so we hope you'll fill that out and send that in as well. Again, if you missed a link or have a question about the webinar, Ken Elkins of Audubon New York is kind enough to list his email there on that slide uh, to answer and field some uh, questions from you. But also remember, you can email each organization who presented today as well. So I'm going to start with some of the questions that came in and we, we will take a, a few since we are a little over time right now. I'm going to start since it's about invasives with a question to Molly or whomever. Uh, one is that many, many people had questions about other invasive species and how to remove them and what to do about them beyond the species that we talked about. So what would you say are the best sources, resources they should go to, to find out information about invasive spread? There was questions about how invasive species spread. Um, if they have a mature Norway maple that's 60 years old, do they really have to take it down or can they just wait till it comes down? Is it going to do much harm? And there you go. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where my video might have cut off during my presentation. I think I lost internet. But um, right where I left off, I think, was talking about 
those partnerships for regional invasive species management. And I saw in the chat that that link was shared. Um, if you find your partnership of in regional invasive species management, your PRISM, and contact them, a lot of times they'll even be able to visit the site or look at pictures that you send them with specific questions, and they should be able to help you figure out if it's a good idea to remove it, the best option to remove the invasive species, and you know which type of treatment method you might use. Like if it is herbicide, they can help you find the right one to use. So I would definitely get in contact with your PRISM. And if you don't know where your PRISM is, if you contact one of them, they could probably help point you in the direction anyhow. Yep. Carolyn, you look like you Carol. want to chime in. I just want to add something about the Norway maples because I have some <clears throat> real life experience, or at least my daughter. My daughter recently lost part of her roof to Norway maples, aging, un unstructured, structurally unsound Norway maples. They are actually quite brittle, and the the um, arborist that she hired to remove um, the rest of the tree told her that he has done a lot of had to do a lot of work with Norway maples. And this was just an ordinary windstorm. It wasn't a hurricane or anything like that. And so they, once they get to a certain age, they are likely to break. So you may wanna think about um, if you have an old one and it is expensive, that's one of the biggest problems is taking it down large trees is very expensive, but you can do it in stages. You don't have to take the whole tree down. You can, if you don't mind the way it looks, if they make excellent woodpecker trees, if you just take the branches off and kill it that way, and then um, woodpeckers will move in and use it. So you don't have to take it all down at once is, is the point I wanna make. And um, I, I had to take mine down over a series of years because one of them was our childhood swing. Um, and of course there was, you know, <laughs> human emotions attached to that. So I had to sort of kill it in stages, <laughs> which I did. But, um, but so I understand the problems with getting rid of big Norway maples, but it's important to do it. Okay, thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Um, actually, the next question, Carolyn, probably for you. Um, so are cultivars of native species inferior for wildlife? Or, or maybe Karen, either of you. Um, and does it reduce the genetic diversity? Um, that question can't be answered without knowing what specific plant you're talking about. It's, there's no one blanket answer to that question for all species. For example, you might wanna buy a dogwood that is resistant to the anthracnose disease. And according to Doug Ptolemy's research, um, that's not a problem. The, 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 the fact that it's disease resistant has nothing to do with how um, insects use it or birds for that matter. Um, but that's just one example. And I could go through a whole litany of examples. Um, the main problem with genetic diversity is, is that a lot of these um, cultivars are cloned and that does reduce genetic diversity. One of the ways to get around that is if you um, buy um, plants, you buy more than one of the same, you, you don't buy all the same clone. So you, you mix them up. So you, you might buy more than one cultivar just so that the plants themselves can get together and <laughs> breed and make more of themselves in, in a much more genetically uh, possible way. Does that help? <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer for, for all plants. <laughs> no, and, I, and studies are continually ongoing. I know at the college we're doing studies on with students on, through the Chicago Botanic Garden on cultivars and how pollinators react to native cultivars. So we had a conference earlier this year with Annie White from Vermont who spoke about her research and uh, it's always ongoing. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, uh, this question I believe is for Michelle. Um, is there a way for people in the same county to connect with each other who are in homegrown national park? Michelle, unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. I was trying to. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are working on that. Um, right now, the best way to do that would be through our, and through our social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook. Um, that, that would really be the best way. I can't, we, we are working on it. There may be an app coming up soon. Yeah, 
you. Um, we had lots of questions on where to find native plants. Uh, I think maybe uh, we can, people can answer that out there at Audubon and Native Plant Center and others. Uh, Carolyn, I'm gonna give this to you and Karen or Ken or whoever. What's the question again? Okay, um, where do you find native, where can you find these native plants? And some people were concerned about the cost of native plants and can, how can it come, how can we bring some of the prices down? I'm gonna put a plug in for Carol and Carolyn in the Native Plant Center. They have a fantastic um, annual plant sale uh, that really has, my garden has flourished under those purchases and they're always healthy and wonderful. It is in the spring, it was later, it's a little later in May, but it's usually orders going in February <clears throat> for an April delivery or pickup. Uh, Audubon centers in Long Island have a series of uh, native plant sales. Our Audubon database that I put at the end of my uh, section, you just can plug in there, uh, your zip code in and what you're looking for and it'll give you um, a sources, local sources for native plants. Uh, Carolyn, did you want to add? I think, and then more well, important, yeah, can I say one more thing? Go and ask sure, for sure. them. Go to your nurseries and ask for them because the more that people ask for them, nurseries want to sell what's profitable and what's profitable is, you know, those bright, sunny, purring invasives and they're in bloom and that's what people want to pick up and put in their garden. If people go with a shopping list and say, I'm looking for this and they hear it over and over again, the, that message will be heard. And there is a good groundswell and with homegrown national park, there's gonna be even more of it. But the more of us, we have a collaboration going on on this Zoom, but let's all collaborate as a collective whole and put the pressure on our nurseries because They'll, they'll, they'll be able to source them. Go ahead, Carolyn. I, I would just wanna address the cost factor. Yeah. And especially if you're doing ground covers, um, it's really a good idea not to buy your ground covers in gallon pots. Try to find um, small little, what they call plugs. And now more nurseries are, are coming online. Um, it used to be you could only buy them wholesale, but now there are a couple of online. Um, there's one called Izel, I-Z-E-L. And mm -hmm. you can buy Izel. I think you can also buy them. Um, I think Pinelands actually now has a retail se uh, section, um, Pinelands Nursery in New Jersey. So if you try to see um, what their online availability is, um, you can get the, these things actually mailed to your front door. And they're tiny little plants, but they take off. Let me tell you, I have photographs of, of whole entire borders that are done with them. And they look, by the end of the season, you would never have guessed that they were just tiny little plugs at the beginning of the season. And actually the same thing is true for most shrubs and trees. The smaller they are when, when you plant them, the faster actually that they grow. And I've proven that by, by putting in full-size trees and then putting in a whip next to it or across the field. And, and in 10 years, they look almost the same. And I'll add to that. Thank you, Carolyn and Karen. Um, yes, we, we, our plant sale is a fundraiser. It's in the spring. Uh, this year was only online. We did not have an in-person sale, but uh, we have great partners in Rosedale Nurseries. If you're in Westchester, they're in Hawthorne, New York. They uh, every year have a benefit Native Plant Weekend and it will be September 12th and 13th this uh, year. They bring in many native plants and even throughout the year. I've seen in the chat other partners. We have Catskill Native Plant Nursery. I saw Earth Tones listed in there. We have Native Landscapes and Palm. Uh, some of those places give discounts to members of the Native Plant Center. <laughs> um, yes, it, it is dif more and more, it, it is difficult as the demand rises for native plants we need to put the pressure on the nurseries to say start carrying them because with these pollinator pathways all over the place and uh, we need to really uh, get get the word out there so just keep demanding this from your from your uh, nurseries your local nurseries that you want native plants uh, Michelle you look like you had a question. yeah um, we do have a list on, uh, on our director and our resource directory a growing list of where to buy native plants we also ran a little bit of a campaign on social media of we're not buying this. 
and showing what the what the invasives were and what we are buying. So it is really creating the consumer demand for the native plants. Excellent. The invasive. Uh, so I have a question about invasive species. Actually, there's kind of two here. One is how do invasive species spread and what do you do when your neighbor has all invasive species and it's spreading into your yard? <laughs> Call Casey into a weed wrangle. <laughs> uh, I like to say I've been known to belly crawl in the middle of the night with a flashlight. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> Molly, what do you, I mean, you want to answer that? At least the invasive, how they spread. Okay, yes. So that first question, invasive species and how they spread. So um, it depends on the species. And they first get over here from, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa, wherever they are, by um, a lot of, well, plant species that we're talking about today, people bring them over to plant them here. Either they saw them online and they purchased them and decided that they wanted to try growing them here because they saw, oh, it fits the hardiness zone. Or, um, you know, they buy them from a nursery who gets them from far, far away and try growing them. And once they're here, they spread either through underground roots, they can spread through seeds. Um, some of the seeds can drop into waterways and spread down streams. Some of them are eaten by birds and spread that way um, and other animals. So it's a wide variety of ways that these invasives can spread. And, you know, that's part of the reason that they're invasive. They just are really good at spreading. A lot of them have multiple different ways that they can spread. What was that second question? Let's see, you made oh, it about the neighbor. Yeah, so you have a neighbor and you know, I, I, funny cause I'm having this problem now, the neighbor like yeah. Atlantis, I didn't have Atlantis forever. And now he's got all these Atlantis growing and, uh, uh, but anyway, it wasn't my question, but I'm asking for somebody else. We actually you could buy them a questions. Doug Tallamy book for, you could buy a Doug mm -hmm. Tallamy book and put it in their mailbox and give it to them for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah, we get a lot of questions about that here too. And I'd tool. say like everyone's talking about education and outreach. If you mm -hmm. can, if they're willing to sit down with you and talk about it, if you're willing to actually get the education to them, I think they might be maybe hopefully more willing to work with you on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it depends, you know. Carol, you're muted. I don't know. Um, I, I think we've kind of ran out of time here. Yeah. Uh, does any panelists want to speak, uh, say anything at the, at the end or answer a question you may want to say or answer? Yeah, Carolyn does. Carolyn? I'll, I'll just say that um, I know we got a lot of questions for people who are working in shady areas. And um, if you go to my website, um, I have um, a list of, um, of, of plants um, for all different kinds of, cons of situations. So you, there's a shade um, list um, on my website. You just have to go to resources and then look for the um, tab for plant lists. So hopefully that can be useful to some people. Wonderful. And, and I wanna say, I know there are questions still coming in, but let's remember all our partner organizations and reaching out to them as resources. In addition to people who presented today, we have the Garden Club of America, New York chapters. Uh, so they are very good resources. Some people were asking about designing and planting and uh, such. And of course, all the, the government agencies today, New York State Parks is also part of this coalition and the DEC, the New York State DEC and Weed Wrangle and Audubon New York and Homegrown National Park, the Native Plant Center, so many of us have uh, resources on our website, classes that we offer, workshops, and, and you know, such as this. So please continue to reach out to us as resources. 
Is there anybody else? Ken, do you need to say anything or want to say anything? Or Karen, I want to thank everybody again. And I'll put a plug in for our 27 chapters throughout North New York State. So they're all over. They're all of over. Of course. I used to so, be a chapter president. So they're a great resource. Uh, there are chapters across the whole country if you're from another state and don't live in New York. Uh, so we're really uh, fortunate to have these organizations doing the right thing. And we know you will too, as a gardener, you're able to just tweak your palate, your planting palate and make a difference in this world. So, and for our wildlife too, which is really important. Thank you all. Look for more of this, hopefully in the future. Great. Happy Invasive Species Awareness Week. Thank you. <laughs>